This is a production of PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, we explore the role community colleges play in retraining America's workforce. Plus, a look back at popular radio and TV icons like Betty Fieser and Grady Cole, who many say felt like family members. And we head to North Carolina's high country to discover a hidden treasure. Please don't go anywhere. Carolina Impact starts right now. Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. How many places have you worked during your career? I'm on my fifth job. The average time most folks stay in a job is a little more than four years. Most Americans will hold seven different jobs over the course of their career, each requiring its own set of responsibilities and necessary skills. That's why education and job training is critically important. Carolina Impact's Jason Terzis tells us more. It's another day at Central Piedmont Community College. Students make their way to and from class, head in and out of campus buildings, go for a jog, and if they're lucky, catch a few minutes of downtime, all while the CityLink's Gold Line trolley rumbles through the heart of campus. Meanwhile, Gerald Freeman makes his way to the library to replace a broken computer. When I moved to Charlotte, I was laid off. Having spent a majority of his life working in construction, Gerald decided to go back to college in his late 50s. He's one of a growing number of people who's made the decision to go back to school. I think I'm always going to be learning. I think life is a process where you learn as you go along. This former Marine earned his first degree in social work. Jobs were few and far between. He then spent years working in construction. But then three years ago, he was dealt a devastating blow. I had a stroke. A stroke that left him with limited movement on his right side and required lots of physical therapy. So basically, I couldn't work at that time. As his body slowly healed, Gerald knew his days in construction were over. He also knew it was time to reinvent himself. Change is constant. Change is always going to happen. He took advantage of a military stipend and enrolled at CPCC, earning associate's degrees in network administration and network technologies. While interning at the college's help desk, he was offered a job in the IT department. At 61, he's now taking online classes at East Carolina University, working towards a Bachelor of Science degree in industrial technology. I honestly like to learn. Gerald's story is unique, but he also represents a growing segment of the population, people going back to school at later stages of life. The United States has over 1,100 public community colleges, educating nearly 6 million students per year. The average age of those students, 28. Community colleges serve not only traditional college-age students, but incumbent workers, entrepreneurs, and the un and underemployed. Their curriculum and their classes are just as good, if not better in some cases, than some um, universities. The main goal at Central Piedmont is to be the nation's leader in workforce development. And in today's ever-changing workplace, there needs to be an ever-changing workforce. Whether you're a PhD engineer or you're a computer programmer, you're going to have to be constantly retrained. During a recent visit to CPCC's main campus, Vice President Joe Biden spoke about today's changing technology and its effects on the workforce. For example, we need 500,000 IT jobs right now, right this minute. We need 1.3 million IT jobs by the end of the decade. With major needs for jobs in technology, nursing, and other fields, Biden spoke about the increasing value community colleges play in today's changing society. Community colleges are the gateways not only to an immediate job and careers, but also to four-year universities and beyond. Biden says there are two things America needs to invest in to keep the economy moving, infrastructure and education. Any nation that out-educates us is going to out-compete us. He says that in the 21st century, 12 years of free public education is no longer enough to achieve middle class status. That's why the Obama administration continues to push for free community college. So our plan is simple and straightforward. If you have good grades, earn your way in, you get to go to community college for free, but only a community college that is quality like this one. Schools have to show a track record of graduating students and placing them actually into jobs. It'll increase the number of students attending community college from 6 million to 13 million students per year. But opponents say the cost to subsidize free community college would be an estimated six billion a year, something a country already trillions of dollars in debt simply can't afford. My Lord, you big spending Democrat, there you go again, <laughs> right? But Biden says the government would easily have that money simply by eliminating tax loopholes. Well, folks, there's one trillion 
$300 billion in tax loopholes in the tax code. So eliminate that one tax loophole, for example. You can pay for all community college free, and you can cut the deficit by another $11 billion a year. Still, the notion of free public community college appeals to many. It's certainly a bold notion and no doubt would create opportunities for many people. And why not? This country is founded on bold notions and subsequent actions. They're going to give hope to people that may not thought about college beforehand. Especially for me as an international student because we pay so much money to, to study here in the, in the United States, so having a free college that's, that's a great thing. Back at the library, Gerald puts the finishing touches on the refurbished computer. It's up and running again, much like his new career. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jason Terzis reporting. Thanks so much, Jason. People all across the country are raving about tiny homes these days. Habitat for Humanity of Cabarrus County is taking note, breaking the rules, and reaching out to another population of people by building these miniature homes. It's happening in a historic African-American mill village in Kannapolis. Carolina Impact's Tanisha Johnson explains. With blades revved up, it all makes for quite the buzz in this quiet Kannapolis neighborhood. Volunteers are working to build a tiny house for Lucy Jackson. I didn't believe that this house was ever gonna get done and I was ever gonna have a place to call my own. She's amazed by how many folks are helping out, like these firefighters oh God, that was close up. who squeeze in time to work on the house when they're not rushing to an emergency call. A, a stroke survivor, Lucy moved to Kannapolis right after Hurricane Katrina destroyed her home in 2005. For about the last 10 years, she hasn't had a place to call home until now. I'm just very blessed and fortunate. My heart is just beating from the love that is poured out here. Like a flip -up table, so that, like, Lucy's you delighted to make some design selections this could okay. be in a time. for her 468 square foot home. I'm going to have barn doors that separate my bedroom from the living room and the kitchen. But unlike most tiny homes on wheels, this one's built on a solid foundation. Habitat for Humanity of Cabarrus County is building smaller homes to tackle a big problem, the lack of affordable housing. About a year and a half ago, we built the first one, and really it, it ex exceeded our expectations to the point that we decided to do another one. Habitat usually builds homes for families, but Dean Dawson says tiny homes are a perfect solution for singles or couples who are living on a fixed income, including veterans or the disabled. A tiny house cost about 45,000 to build compared to a standard house nearly double in size, costing more than 75,000. Since it costs less to build a tiny house, a homeowner's monthly out-of-pocket expenses are just under $300 per month, which is more in line with their income. As a builder, it's fun to do something uh, like this because it's, it's not something normal. For us, it feels good to serve families, and if we can reach deeper and serve those that are even even lower on the, the income scale and, and in need, it just it makes it all the better. One nail at a time, other habitat groups across the country are starting to notice what's going on here in Kannapolis. So we had other habitats from all over the state come in and take a look at it. We had city officials from other counties come and look at it. We've had inquiries from Washington State, Oregon, Kansas, Texas, Florida. Um, so it, it, what was fringe is now becoming more mainstream with the tiny houses. Since Kannapolis used to be a mill town, many of the lots where mill workers lived are small. That's why tiny houses are an ideal solution to utilize these small plots of land and to help revive neighborhoods in decline. But none of this would be possible without volunteers like Joe, who's also determined to get back on his feet. My biggest thing is uh, trying to pay, pay it forward. Somebody gave me the opportunity to it, so I should be able to give, give back. Joe's putting in sweat equity because he's also on the list to get a Habitat house. They tried to put me in a uh, tiny house, but I eventually want a family, so I don't think it would be a fit for me, but for uh, Lucy, though, for Lucy, it's perfect for Lucy. A little person for a little house, yeah, it's perfect for her. Joe works alongside volunteer Jack Stein, who's retired. So now I get to do 
projects for other people. It's enjoyable. And since Jack isn't as young as he used to be. So he does the heavy lifting. And he, uh, I teach him, he teaches me. It's, a, it's kind of a good working relationship. As this tiny house on East C Street takes shape, one thing is clear. This building is more than a building. It uh, is really a blessing. While Lucy has struggled to get back on her feet since her stroke and Hurricane Katrina, the one thing that brings her hope is knowing she'll soon have a place she can afford and a place to call home. For Carolina Impact, I'm Tanisha Johnson reporting. Thanks so much, Tanisha. Habitat of Cabarrus is the first in the country to build tiny homes. Project managers say tiny houses are a great option for those with an annual income between twelve dollars to $19,000. Well, remember when milk was 82 cents a gallon, gas was 23 cents a gallon, and a postage stamp set you back only three cents? A lot has changed since the 1950s, including Charlotte's radio and television personalities. Carolina Impact's Danielle Koser reintroduces us to some familiar faces. Remember when I Love Lucy was the top rated TV show across the nation? One, two! And rock and roll was on the rise. Back in the 1950s and 60s, Charlotte played host to a handful of legendary radio and TV personalities of its own. Good morning. Turn your dial back to the 50s when Grady Cole graced the airwaves of WBT Radio. This is Grady Cole and it's WBT Charlotte, North Carolina. Cole started his career as a newspaper reporter, volunteering to read the news on the radio to promote the afternoon paper. Eventually, he got a full-time gig at WBT Radio, hosting the morning show. Listeners like Jerry Shin were drawn to his conversational delivery and personal commentary. I felt as if I knew him. Uh, I certainly knew the voice. The voice was gravel and molasses. And it was like the voice of your next door neighbor who had come over to sit on the porch and just talk. But you know, Grady was, was, was preeminent and, and still is for that matter. After more than 30 years, Cole retired in 1961, passing the mic to Ty Boyd. Could hardly open my mouth that first day, honestly. And I'd listen to him with my father and with my family. Over on WGIV 1600. This is Chatty Hattie, the queen of the South. Hattie Leeper first took a seat behind the mic when she was just 14 years old. I went into character. When I would see a microphone, oh my goodness, I was comfortable. See, these were samples because... Known to listeners as Chatty Hattie, she was a trailblazer, breaking through the lines of race and gender as the first African-American female radio announcer in North Carolina. WGIV was the first local radio station focusing on the needs and interests of the black community. We were rapping before rap came out, you know. We rhymed everything that uh, we would say on the air. We would rhyme, and it made sense. Today, surrounded by awards, she's still right at home behind the microphone. This is Chatty Hattie, WGIV in Charlotte. Take care. Bye-bye. Now here's one of the nation's top television authorities, Betty Feaser. By the 1950s, more than 90% of Americans owned a television. And just as flour and sugar were staples in the pantry, the Betty Feaser Show was a staple on television. Hello. Our show for today begins right here with the lesson in how to make a scarf. Which can the Martha Stewart of her day. Every weekday at noon, Feaser stood in front of the camera, teaching viewers how to cook a casserole or remove a stain from a shirt. You turned on the TV, you might be cleaning, you might be sewing, you might be cooking, but Betty was your friend in the home. As a newlywed, Nancy Bass was a loyal viewer. She remembers writing to get a pencil and paper to jot down instructions from Beezer. If you'd like to make one of these, be sure you have your pencil and paper ready so I can give you dimensions. That's right, Betty Beezer, get it out there. Not relying on a single note card or a teleprompter during the hour-long broadcast, Fieser talked to viewers like members of her family. If I'd seen her on the street, I'd walk up and say, hey, Betty, I watch her every day. And she would, I'm sure, been right there for you. She was a beautiful lady. 
Fieser died at age 53 after a short battle with cancer. But today, her memory and recipes live on. When Betty died, WBTV treated it as if it were a state funeral. That's how much respect this woman had. Until then, this is Betty Fieser. Goodbye. News with Doug Mays. Also on the airwaves at WBTV, Doug Mays. Good evening, this is Doug Mays reporting. Before he was an anchorman, he was a musician, playing bass fiddle at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. I was born into what was in those days called a country music family, hillbilly music. Mays worked at WBT Radio before making the switch to television in 1952. His first gig, working as an ESSO reporter, one of only six across the nation. ESSO was big and so was he. Soon, he found a permanent home at WBTV News. Debbie Stairs remembers gathering around the television with her parents every night to watch the news. It was something that you did. It was, you know, we watched Bonanza, we watched Doug Mays. Later in his career, Mays found a new home at WSOC, a move that shocked everyone. Secretary of State Haig is on his way back to Washington. In a 2011 interview, Mays reflected on his more than 30-year career. I'm one of the luckiest broadcasters. And I'm aware of the role that luck has played in my life, and I'm grateful for it. And the people who have been loyal to me as a, as a viewer, I didn't make myself. They made me by tuning in at night. He passed away in October of 2015 at age 93, just months after being inducted into the Charlotte Broadcast Hall of Fame, recently created by PBS Charlotte and members of the local media. I didn't feel like Doug was a celebrity. I felt like he was a real person who took pride in his job. There was just a professionalism. Four legendary radio and TV personalities who helped pave the way for broadcasting in the Queen City. Today, they're remembered in the Charlotte Broadcast Hall of Fame and in the hearts of many. For Carolina Impact, I'm Danielle Kosa reporting. Thanks so much, Danielle. Joining me now is Mark Washburn, writer, columnist, and media reporter at the Charlotte Observer. Mark, thanks so much for your time. We appreciate you being with us. My pleasure. Nobody better to talk with when it comes to the history of TV and radio personalities in our area. You know, I wasn't around all the time that you have been, but I learned so much from the story. And Betty Fieser just seems like one of those people that I would want to hang out with. Betty Fieser was the first of the home, home economists, I think they were called in those days. And to this day, they still get calls in the WBTV newsroom on deadline often, you know, hey, I need Betty's recipe for this or that. And it's funny that not only did the generation who watched her remember her, but the children of the, because they, they'll call and they'll go, I remember my mother watching mm -hmm. Betty Fieser every day at 1 p.m. And uh, so she just became, you know, a, a, leading, a leading light in the community. And you know, can you translate that to, to people today? It seems like we're a little different in the media than we were back in the 50s. That's true. Now, um, people still have great recognition. I think Doug Mays once said he didn't know if this television thing was ever going to work out, but when he'd go out to restaurants, people would recognize him and start coming up to him, and he thought, eh, there might be something to this. Grady Cole was probably the first and perhaps one of the greatest uh, broadcasters. He was on WBT and known everywhere. Um, Grady promoted fights. He was a boxing enthusiast. And he got Jack Dempsey, the greatest boxer of the time, to come down occasionally. They were on their way to Shelby, I think, and, uh, and uh, Grady had a big touring car, a big Packard with top down. And, Highway Patrol trooper pulled him over for speeding. Jack Dempsey was driving, and the officer came up, got Dempsey's license, and started to walk back. Didn't recognize who he was. And Grady Cole, sitting next to him, says, hey, that's Jack Dempsey. And the officer spun around and said, by my stars, is, is that you, Grady Cole? Why didn't you tell me you were driving Mr. Cole? <laughs> and they got a police escort to Shelby. So that shows you the impact and the power of this new medium at that time, how just by the man's voice, uh, people would recognize him. And, um, and he became everybody's friend. He was in their living room every morning, and that was, that was the way it went. Back when the media was your friend. It was, yeah. Now the media's not so friendly. Uh, 
what's the big lesson learned, do you think, as we look back on the past? It's one of the things that we love to do at public television is give that historical perspective and think about how can we take something from the past and use it for the present or the future? I think one lesson is just the leadership of these people. Um, they were very, uh, very important in town. They were seen as leaders. They, they talked to you every day. They were, they were your friends, your neighbors. And, um, th and these people really became as, as popular and as powerful as the mayor or your state senator because you connected with them in such a way and with such regularity that um, you, you were under their spell, if we can say that. And, and that spell, that, that beautiful golden age of television, is it not so golden now that we have so many different channels? to choose from, that people, we don't have that handful that your local folks were the, the, the biggest thing since sliced bread back in the day and not so much now? I think so, and uh, you can get anything you want. You can get affirmation for any point of view you want on television because there's so much variety and diversity. The media is also now seen as just this one big lump of this glob of, of anger or, or whatever and negativism. And uh, I think we saw that in the riots uh, here in town recently. Uh, the media was attacked uh, several times. Um, uh, people in the media were attacked, the vehicles were attacked, and um, you know, you just didn't see that in the old days. There was respect for the media that was earned, and I would have to say that probably the disrespect is earned as well. So as we wrap things up, what's sort of the, the takeaway nugget that we want people to remember when we look at the past of this, this great era of television and radio? I, I think it was just a charming time. It was a simple time. You look at the studios, you look at what was happening. Everything was simple. It was an uh, era of books and not online. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's a historical document just in the way things were done. Mark Washburn. Charlotte Observer, thank you so much for following the media all these years, and thanks for sharing your information with us. My pleasure. Well, crisp fall air and vibrant shades of red and yellow, truly fall is my favorite time of year. If you're heading to North Carolina's high country, one place you may want to visit is Linville Caverns. In tonight's One Tank Trip, producer Russ Hunsinger shows us how a subterranean world inside Humpback Mountain gives visitors a unique way to admire a grand work of nature that's centuries old. All right, everybody, welcome to Limbo Caverns. My name's Kayla, I'm gonna be your tour guide today. Make sure y'all watch your heads. The first thing you notice in here is the temperature, right? It's cold. Chilly. It was really cold. It stays about 53 degrees year round, regardless of the weather outside. Follow me on up this way, please. Limbo Caverns is what's known as an active limestone cavern. So all our rocks and formations inside are still growing and forming. The caverns was discovered in 1822 by two fishermen. And fishermen who were outside noticed that the fish were swimming in and out of the mountain. So they just got bold and followed them right on in. Open to the public for touring in 1937. We are a limestone cavern, so they show you the limestone inside. This is a type of limestone known as shady dolomite. They show you stalactites. These are what's known as ribbon stalactites. They tell you about different formations, how they form. So this is a natural rock formation, just happens to look like an alligator. So I like to call him the rockodile. Typically they see fish in the pool. There's a little blue crawfish. Thank you for pointing that out. You may see a bat or two in the winter time. They come in to hibernate from around November to April. They take you over a place called the bottomless pool. We call it that because we don't actually know how deep this water is. We have a lantern inside there that most of the guides turn on. And this is so you can see what early cave explorers were dealing with when they came in here. Then that prepares everybody for total darkness. Put your hand in front of your face and wiggle your fingers around. I'm sure you've heard the saying, now you see it, now you don't complete darkness and um, you couldn't see any light. There was no light visible. You could just feel everything. I couldn't really see anything at all. I wasn't expecting any of fish or animals in the streams. He's really brave. He sticks out of that hole all day, every day. I was just expecting just water and not any animals. You can't go many places and go into a cave. It's something unique. It's, a, it's an experience that they don't get to 
See? And you also will be allowed to touch the walls in there. I really liked when we got to go inside of the really narrow area. We were able to like touch the walls and kind of like feel kind of how the inside of the cave is. It was pretty like slimy, kind of smooth. Uh, I wasn't really expecting that from, from rocks, but it was really interesting. Here is what we call a frozen Niagara. It looks like a giant waterfall. It's been frozen in motion. I learned about all types of different rocks. It was awesome, cool, chilly. I hope that they take home a new knowledge of what it's like to be inside a place like this and to see what actually happens inside of some mountains. Flowstone, if it's given the right conditions, will grow about one inch every 125 years. I also hope that they had an enjoyable time, had fun going through, had a guide who was spontaneous and could show them different things and just enjoyed their trip in general. Did any of y'all guys get dripped on while you were here today? Yes. All right, it's actually a good thing. We call it the kiss of the caves, a little legend around here. Every kiss you get from the cave is about two days of good luck. So hopefully that works out for y'all. I hope you had a good time while you were here. Thanks so much, Russ. Linville Caverns is about a two hour drive from Charlotte. For more details, go to pbscharlotte.org, click on the watch tab and local shows, and then Carolina Impact. Well, by the way, congratulations to Steve Turner of Fort Mill and Helena Babington Giles of Charlotte. They recently won a pair of free tickets to a recent art show. Well, be sure to friend us on Facebook for your chance to win monthly prizes. This month, we're giving away a DVD set of Poldark featuring seasons one and two. And I am a huge Poldark fan, so if you haven't caught that show, I know you'll enjoy it. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you back here again next time on Carolina Impact. Good night, my friends. of PBS Charlotte.